Hi, everybody. My name is Dexter Mosco. Yes, that's my real name, not a stage name. Although I have been in television for many years, helping people to sell in that kind of environment. And today we need to be broadcasters and presenters. So today, Prosper and I are going to be talking about how you make that connection, how you sell, how you influence and persuade on the online prosperity show. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope you gain something of benefit from it. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, and I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga. In today's episode, I have a very special guest, ladies and gentlemen. Dexter, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing very, very good, Prosper. Thank you so much for inviting me at your time zone and my time zone here. It's a delight to speak to you. Absolutely, and it's going to be fun. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, Dexter is aptly known as the Picasso of sales. He's a renowned presentation skills coach and practitioner in positive intelligence. Now, Dexter helps his clients to create businesses, um, you know, to create business winning sales presentations and pitches and conversations that empower them to realize their full potential, both personally and professionally. Now, with a unique coaching style that he brings to the table that he develops through his experience, guess where? advertising on TV uh, while he was doing his QVC uh, TV promotions there. Dexter brings with him a wealth of knowledge on how to captivate his audiences in the televisual age of um, advertising that we now live in. And he's recognized in and around the UK, um, you know, for the work that he has done. He's also an author. If you notice behind him, when he talks, um, he's the author of a book, Stand Up and Sell, which shows invaluable insights on effective sales and presentation techniques. It is a pleasure to have you, Dexter, all the way from uh, the UK on our show today. But I've got to ask, everybody who's going to be watching this show, Dexter, is that your real name? <laughs> Prosper, I am often asked that. And, and I actually, when I'm on networking events or when I, I'm in front of people in, in a room and audience, I say, it is my real name. Um, it is not a stage name. But as you've already referenced, for many years, I was on TV for QVC, the shopping channel, um, which is a live shopping channel. It presents various products. And I was both in front of the camera and behind the cameras. So, yeah, the, the name Dexter, it's an American name. Moscow, I, nowadays I hesitate to mention my surname for the obvious <laughs> reason. Um, but yes, it, I, I think I had uh, parents with a sense of humor giving me the name Dexter. Fantastic. <laughs> we were talking about parents with that sort of sense of humor when I was saying, hey, my name also <laughs> carries a bit of luggage there. I can't be seen on the side of the street with a sign sticking out saying, hey, say, <laughs> spare me a dollar. Um, you know, my name is Prosper. So at the end of the day, I'm really happy that we have you on the show today. Now, can you just tell us a little bit about your journey and how you became a presentation skills coach and a practitioner in positive intelligence? I, I suppose it's true to say it was by accident. Um, I started many, many years ago in advertising, and I, I suppose that's when my love of words was created. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and I, I helped in the production department, so we got adverts into the newspaper. So I think at some point I was always involved in advertising. Um, and I this was really came about from, I suppose, from my dad. Um, I lost my dad when I was only 10 years old, and he had always wanted to be a copywriter. And there, there is a song by Mike and the Mechanics called The Living Years, and there is a part of the lyric that says, that we are held hostage to parents' hopes and fears. And so I think psychologically, that's where I wanted to be. Um, unfortunately, I was made redundant uh, because it was at a time when cigarette advertising was banned on TV. And overnight, we lost a million pounds. And that was a long, long time ago. So it was a lot of money. Um, and then I went into practice with my brother as an estate agent. 
people, please don't hate me. In in England, people don't particularly like estate agents, but um, certainly I, I was there for a bit of time and I trained negotiators how to be more effective in their communication, if you like, with people. And I suppose that's led me to where I am today. A, a friend said, I know you train people. Would you like to appear on QVC selling some um, and this is some time ago now, recording equipment, TV recorders, um, VHS recorders. So I said, yeah, sure. What's QVC? I, I didn't even know that it was a live TV channel. And a lot of what I do now, helping people sell in, as you said before, in this televisual age, because I believe, and you are uh, an example of it, we are all broadcasters and presenters. And so what I do is I work with my clients both in front of the camera and in live situations, so on Zoom and in the room, to help them present themselves more effectively so that they win the business they desire, which I, I suppose is one of the reasons we're, we're chatting today. Fantastic. And just to acknowledge, um, you know, the passing of your father, even though it's um, ages ago, it's just one of those things that you don't want to experience um, you know, as a kid, but you did also reference that your dad's influence, you know, being who, um, what he expected of you now, you know, sort of has culminated into this and then your background as well, when it came to, um, you know, advertising and property, um, you know, also brought you towards where you are now. Now, how has this background, especially the one in advertising, and you also mentioned the people in the UK don't like property and TV, influence your coaching style that you are uh, giving people at the moment? In fact, you've just mentioned the word influence. I, I believe, uh, certainly it is true of the UK, that we don't like being sold to. We like being informed. We like to be influenced and, and persuaded. And this certainly came about from my understanding working in advertising. You know, the, one time they used to say that sex sells and they always used to have these beautiful people um, advertising their various products. They had celebrities advertising their products. I think the world has changed. Um, it's turned. And, and I think it is a basic reality. It, it's, it's almost like a, um, a, a truth, a universal truth, that people buy emotionally. And if you have a look at in any of the advertising, be it in a print form or on TV, there's always an emotional connection to it. And I suppose that's what I took from advertising. And, and when I was at QVC, they actually sent me out to the States because obviously it's an American owned company. And what I saw, the way that they presented on TV to influence and persuade people, um, customers, that it, it wasn't about the hard sell. And what we did, we brought it back from the States and my team at that time. And we said, you know, what they do in America won't necessarily work here. It must be softer. It must be more engaging. And a, a lot of what I did there, and, and I, run, I ran what they call guest excellence seminars, um, was to understand that it's a conversation. It's what we're doing now. It's question and answer. It's storytelling. And, and so that's what came from advertising right the way through to what I do today. Tell stories, engage with people, don't sell, influence and persuade. Absolutely, because people like buying stuff, but they don't like being sold to. And the whole concept of QVC is show and tell, you know, and it basically is showing people, um, you know, cutting, you know, onions with just one one slice of a knife and you end up with 36 knives that you're never going to be able to use. But it's just basically how it works. Now, you also keep alluding to the fact that what we're doing right now um, is part of what you call the televisual sort of age. We are now all broadcasters. Can you just elaborate on this concept of this televisual age and why it's very um, crucial for individuals to create engaging and entertaining uh, presentations, especially when they're trying to sell their products. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the key element is that word, that, again, that you've just used, engagement. 
Um, I, I talk about a particular process that, that we did when we were on QVC, and we've translated it now to whether we're in the room or on the Zoom um, situation. And I call it the four E's. And the first of those E's is engagement. So, so how do you engage with an audience? The, the key here is to understand really what the audience wants, what the people that you're speaking to. Never assume that you know what their problems are. It, it is our responsibility to ask the, the questions, as you're doing with me, to elicit what their problem is. And when you can do that, then you can offer the solutions that you have already um, suggested by working with other people. I have a mantra, one of many, and it says this, don't tell me what you do, tell me what you have done for others. Storytelling, it's again that storytelling element. So engagement, especially in this environment, as it's the same with TV, is that we have to get people's attention within the first seven seconds. So we have to do something. We can tell a story. We we can have a joke with people. Um, or we can just say, which I don't think I have said to you yet, thank you for inviting me to have this conversation. So it that's, that's an element of engagement. And it's an understanding the right way through a discussion. We need to maintain that engagement. Um, and if we are presenting as we are here, every eight to 10 minutes, we need to do something to re-engage. It could be a question, um, asking for involvement, asking people to write something down or using a prop or, or whatever occurs to you. So that's the first E. The second E is enlightenment. We need to be able to tell people something that they already know because that's comforting. It closes the gap between us as the presenter and the audience. It's comforting to know that something they're doing is right. Then the key here is to tell them something they don't know. That's the second element of enlightenment, something that um, is happening in the marketplace, something that's happening in their sector that they may not be aware of. The third element of enlightenment is absolutely key. It's called FOMO. You know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. And I would do that in a presentation because I've just asked you a question. So it's a form of re-engagement because I've asked a question of you. Um, FOMO is the greatest motivation for somebody to do something. And what that means is that you're telling people something that others are doing that they're not doing that they may be missing out on. So that's the, the second element. The third element, and again, I hope this is what we will be doing today, is entertainment. If you've got an audience, you've got to entertain. That can be telling a joke, if you're good at telling jokes. It certainly is using appropriate slides. I don't believe in this environment, and slides are worthwhile, because you want to engage with people. They, you want to see them, they need to see you. The only time that I would ever use slides um, is to illustrate something. Never ever use a lot of words because the audience will read ahead of you. And that's true when you're in the room or in, your, in this environment. So entertainment is about having a bit of fun because if they're having fun, we're having fun. That's one of the ways to communicate. The fourth E is actually what we've just talked about. It's about excitement. You've got to be excited. If we're not excited, how the hell are we going to make other people excited? And then that, I've actually said the four E's, but there's another one. And we've already touched on this one, emotion. Make the emotional connection. Again, we need to be emotionally connected to what we're talking about. And hopefully then our audience will be emotionally connected to us so that they can decide whether we are nice people to do business with. And that that's the key. I, I hope that's beneficial. Absolutely. Because, you know, all those five E's, you promised us four, but you gave us an extra one for good measure. You know, and that's absolutely incredible. The engagement, the enlightenment, the entertainment, the excitement, and the whole emotional connection because if people are not connected to a story or people are not connected to a message, there's no way they would think that is of relevance to them. Now, obviously this is part of what you're teaching people and this 
only comes in with maybe the second E, which is the enlightenment, where people are actually learning something new, um, you know, that you would have taught them. Now, in your coaching experience, what are the most common challenges that individuals are facing when it actually comes to maybe delivering an effective presentation or a pitch that actually gets them to win business? I, I believe that the, the key element of any successful pitch presentation is something that we've alluded to. It's really understanding what the needs are of that person that you're speaking to, whether it's one or many. It, it is our responsibility, almost like a doctor, to find out the real pain, the real problem. And I use those words advisedly, you know, because sometimes you see people talking about the challenges that we're experiencing. A challenge for me is something that we can overcome. It's like throwing down the gauntlet and somebody say, yeah, I can resolve this for you. But when you talk about, and it, this is semantics, but words are important. If it is a problem, if it is a pain that is keeping them awake at night, and, and, you know, there are very many reasons now where people are in pain or in fear. Um, we know what's happening in the wider world. We know that people are under pressure financially. Um, you know, prices are rising, energy costs are rising, all, all of this thing. So what we need to do, we know that's the surface pain. What we really need to do is dig deep, deeper. Um, it is our responsibility, like it would be with a doctor, not to find out what the symptom is, but what the real cause is. And that the only way we can do that is by asking questions. And, and again, a mantra, a mantra, never assume you know, because assumption kills the deal every time. So that's for me, that's the absolute key. Whether you're talking to one or many, find out what are the problems they're facing, the fears and concerns that are keeping them awake at night, and then see if we can help them by telling a story. And there is a story uh, framework, which, which I'm happy to, to talk about. Um, it's a two-minute storytelling framework that identifies the incident of what you came to hopefully solve a problem for a client. Again, that word problem. So what was the situation that the client found themselves in? What was the action? That's the second element of the storytelling. What was the action? And actually is the main body of that two minute presentation, that two minute storytelling. What, was, what did you actually do to resolve the problem? And the third element is the benefit statement. What was the benefit of your involvement. So incident, action, benefit. And if you can quantify that benefit in terms of financial gain, money saved, time saved, or the retention of talent, that's a major problem at the present moment. If you can illustrate how you have helped somebody in that way, you don't need to sell to them. They will say, you can help me in exactly the same way. So allow people to step into somebody else's experience and then you don't need to sell. You are influencing and persuading. Absolutely. I love that because storytelling, we, we are as human beings societal at the core and the way we learn is through stories, like anything that, um, you know, conveys a message that is worth remembering you know, it's told through a story. Like you told you like the story of, of your dad and how Michael in the Mechanics has that song, which you see all those elements I can remember because it came in story format, okay? And now that we are maybe working around, um, you know, sort of virtual um, basis, okay? We, we've got to show up on a Zoom meeting like this and you may have apologized to me earlier saying, oh, maybe my internet is not going to be working. Do you think this setup presents problems than when people are speaking face-to-face -face because then you can be able to pick up on cues? Are they enjoying my story? Are they, um, you know, taking what I'm saying? Do I need to explain a little bit more? Because you could be frozen right now and I wouldn't know whether you're receiving the story or not you know what i mean yes. and 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 do, you know do you think um there's a difference between virtual 
selling and um, the selling in, in, in you know face to face. Yes, I, I, it's a, an excellent point. Uh, I think that we are hidebound by our technology. We, we need to be aware of how to improve um, the the how we are perceived. Um, certainly on a mechanical level, so that we need to have proper lighting. Um, if we can put a background up, then and and this is an interesting point that you've made. You, I can see, are in your your room in your library. Um, and so you've got books that, that conveys a certain atmosphere. I decided, rightly or wrongly, to put these two um, frameworks up, these, these books, because that's what I do partly. Um, so I think that, yeah, it's it's the image you want to convey. If you are in a group situation where a lot of people are showing their background, their room, then I will change this. I will um, move it to a, a neutral or I will actually show my room behind me. So I'm in my my study as we speak. So, um, yeah, that that is it's about perception and it is about making sure that you are connecting with people. It, uh, there are different cues, as you quite rightly said. We have to be much more aware of people drifting in and out, looking at their eyes, making eye contact, listening very careful to their voice and tonality, and being aware of, of how people receive and perceive information differently. So if I was talking to somebody who is very visual, I would speak very, very quickly like this. If I wanted to just make the words hang in the air, because for some people words are important, I would slow it down. Where we want people to be, and I would slow it down completely because that's at the level of emotional connection. So we have to be aware of those kind of cues that we use in this environment. It is easier when you are in a room of people because you can read their body language rather than just this area here. So it, it's a point well made. And we need to be aware that the only thing that we can do in this environment and we've said it before, is not sell, but make that connection so somebody can decide, especially when we're faced in networking situations with lots of different images of people, the only thing that we can do is for them to decide, is that a person I can work with? Do I trust that person? Are they authentic? And I apologize for perhaps a slight profanity, but this screen that we're looking at is the biggest bullshit monitor People know whether you're bullshitting or not, or not. And it was the same at QVC. This is why when you watch things like this, when you watch these online shopping channels, we need to make that connection with the presenter. If they can't do that, then they are losing their audience. And the same is true of us. Absolutely. I like that. I like how you were, you know, dissecting just this, show we are on right now you know citing the, the the shelf behind me and visual cues that are there without me having said anything and obviously like you said this screen obviously the black mirror of horrors is literally showing you know up in the world and showcasing who we are in a sea of me to other people that um you know say we're doing the same thing that we're doing now Dexter, my question to you is how can individuals differentiate themselves and their offerings, um, you know, in a competitive market where everybody seems to be saying the same thing and showing up on Zoom like like this? Mm. It, you know, this is a very interesting question and a very relevant question. Um, and it's the um, my answer comes from research that that I've just been aware of. And it's quite frightening actually for anybody that is selling a service um, themselves or a product and that is uh, and this has come I haven't actually got the um, particular organization in front of me to be able to quote this I, I can perhaps send it to you um, but it's a, a marketing science um, organization a non-for-profit in America and it said this at any given time only five percent of your audience is actually in the market to buy. So if all we are doing is selling and pitching, we are only connecting with 5% of the market. So that means 95% of the time, people are not listening. 
they're not even in the market to buy. So how do we change that? How do we, when we are making these presentations, when we're discussing with potential people, I call them suspects, not prospects, but when we're talking to people like that, it's about creating a brand image. It's it's about brand identity. So it is, and I make no apologies for saying it again, it's telling stories of how we have helped people um, in the hope that that social proof the reality of what we've done, people will say at some point, I remember that person. And perhaps now is the time to have a chat to see if they can help me. So it's absolutely key. We are told it's all about lead generation. It's always about selling to people. That's at the bottom of our funnel. What we should be doing is helping people to make a decision of at least listening over a period of time. So we're, if you like, future-proofing our sales funnel. Load it from the top, work with the people at the top, inform them through newsletters, um, via LinkedIn, via social media, any way that gets the message out that this is what we have done for others, that mantra again. Because when we do that, that's long-term engagement. We know that networking is a slow burn. And when we're in networking situations, it's never about selling to the person in front of us. It's informing that person who they may know but will need our help at some time. Now, that's frightening to realize that it is not the people that are buying who we're talking to. It is 95% of others who at some time will make a decision. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really I'm intrigued with that because... Um, at any given moment, like you say, that 5% is what we call early adopters. And they are not only just responsive to your message, but they're just adopting whatever is in the marketplace that can solve their problems immediately. So the way you engage them and the way you then convert them into customers that pay, stay and refer will then lead those people to become what for lack of a better term, sneezers that can then sneeze and spread the idea virus to that 95% that um, we're missing out in the marketplace. But you need to have those stories from that 5% that you mentioned. And, um, you know, in order for you to have a business that's profitable and enjoyable. Now, you have in your coaching and the way that you work nine steps that you help people with and they spell the acronym potential and that just really stands out for me and um they are actually the i think four cornerstones of a business winning presentation um that you've developed can you walk us through that um process and also tell us how our audience can actually get a hold of you so that they can actually get started with working with you there, Dexter. With pleasure. Thank you, Prosper. The, the nine steps of sales potential, uh, it is an acronym, um, the potential word. Um, and it's uh, one just thing to say is that if people are going to use acronyms, explain them. You know, to, to give an acronym without an explanation and people are just sitting there thinking, what the is they talking about? Um, so, so let me run that through to a certain extent. Um, potential, the key here is about keeping control of a sales conversation because we know what normally happens. We normally abide by their sales process and their sales process tells us that, okay, tell us what you think you can help us with. Give, your, give us your best ideas, send us a proposal, and then they disappear. Or they get, worst of all, they give it to a competitor. So potential keeps us on track and them. We are in command of that conversation. So the P for potential, and I'll run through this quite quickly, is personal impact. So what? how do we start a conversation that creates that authenticity, that emotional connection? So it's always there, that emotional connection. The O is objective, if you like, the agenda. What is it that we're going to talk about? And it assumes that we've already had a preliminary discussion with somebody. Um, and that therefore, we need to create the agenda. And the, the purpose of the objective is a mutual objective. Not only what we want 
from the, the conversation, but what they want. That again, that research. And it leads into the T, which is trouble. That's the pain. And there we spend the longest time on this step because we want to find out what the real problem is. You know, you go to a doctor and you say, I've got a pain in my shoulder. And the doctor turns around and says, take two pills and come back and see me in a week. We are ill used there. And the doctor doesn't do that. What he will say is, well, have you been picking up something? Have you been twisting badly? Have you lifted a heavy weight? They seek to find out what the root cause is. That's our objective on that trouble step. The E of it is everybody. Often we find that we're talking to somebody who are not the decision makers. And so we need to find out who is going to be in the room and we can ask that question. You know, I ov obviously and I always say this. When I make a buying decision, I have a chat with my wife. Um, that may be the situation for them. It certainly would be in a large organiz organization. If you're speaking to the CEO, he will speak to his financial director or he will speak to others whose advice he, he likes and trusts. So knowing who is there, there in the room or who you need to get into the room is absolutely key to doing a deal. Um, I had a situation recently which I was brought in to talk to a media buying agency. The one person who was not in that room was the CEO. I had all the other directors there, but the CEO, for some reason, and I, I suspect it was because he didn't want to spend the money, he wasn't in that room. We had a subsequent Zoom conversation. He wasn't on that Zoom call. Did I do the deal? No, because the one person I needed to influence, I never got to see. So knowing who is there is so important. The N of the, this potential is numbers. Sometimes we will be asked to tell them how much it's going to cost to employ us or what the product is, what the service is, whatever element, that's the numbers bit. And, and sometimes they will say, okay, send us a proposal. What I always say is, if you're going to submit a proposal, be there, either on Zoom or in the room, to talk it through. Because we know what happens. You send this proposal, you work on it, you show what the problems is, uh, are, the, how you can resolve them. And then what happens? You send it through and you never hear from them again. So always table the the, the, if you need to to put that in front of them, always table the proposal or say, I'm going to send this through to you, but I want to talk this through with you. Or you say, I want a second bite. If you're seeing other people, then I want to have second bite to see what they are doing and see if I can help you financially or whatever. So numbers is absolutely important. The second T is target. So what is or never leave a conversation without arranging the next meeting or the next conversation. So that's the target. If you like, it's the second agenda. And what is the timescale of it? So it, it's always about keeping control, being knowing, if you like, what the next step is that we want to create. Not their next step, but our next step. So that's the, the target. Um, the I is includes, they may want to know what actually are we going to do? Be very careful here. Give them um, some process, but don't tell them exactly what you're going to do because you want that when you have that final conversation and talk about uh, you know, your contract, my contract, whatever that is. So that's, that's the, the includes bit. The A is afterthoughts. So we've been discussing in a pitch situation, I understand what the problems are. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to speak about? Never, ever leave this step out because you may be leaving some money on the table, a situation that they haven't spoken about, but you can again help them with. So always ask those afterthoughts question. And the last bit, the L, is last words. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to take you out and shoot you. Sometimes they might do. But the last words are, and are we going to do business? 
you need to set that up very early in the conversation. If you like on that objective step, we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to find out more about what you're going to, what you do. I'm going to ask some deep and searching questions. I'm sure you have questions for me. Um, but if we may be at the end of it, then neither of us are going to do business with each other. And that last words is, if we are not going to be business with you, the with us, who do you know that may be, what we talked about would be of interest to them. You're asking for referrals. And it's a step that a lot of people will miss out because they don't have the courage to ask it. Even if you're not going to do business with them, you have an opportunity to say, well, who do you know that would be prepared to work with us? So that's potential. That's keeping control. Um, have we got time just to talk about those um, the, the four elements of a presentation? This is absolutely key. In any situation where we're seeking to influence and persuade somebody or a group, we need four elements of it. The first is your personal credibility. What is it about you that others talk about you that give you credibility? It could be your history. You know, a lot of people now are coming out of corporate life to open their own businesses, their own consultancies, to invent a product. So that background is also very important. So it's about your own personal credibility, how you're perceived in the world. Again, that social proof and also that element of brand marketing. The second element is company credibility. So what are the companies that you've worked with? We've already talked about QVC. I, I could talk about Mothercare, um, which is an organization I work with. The third element is the facts. What are the facts, that logic part of it? We've talked about the emotion, which is the potential. Um, that, that third element is facts. And the fourth element is absolutely key, WIFM which is not a radio station, it's what's in it for me. You know that, you know that. So those are the, the frameworks that I use constantly to create pitches for people, to pitch myself to my prospects and suspects, um, and to keep control of conversations. I, I hope that's beneficial to your audience. I, I was actually expecting and anticipating somebody to knock on the door with an invoice because you know you should be charging for this ted talk right now so if you're watching this right now you should actually uh jump on and you didn't tell us where people can get a hold of you so that we can put that what? in the show notes there okay have a look on my linkedin profile um which is obviously dexter mosso um, you can contact me on my email address, which is Dexter, D-E-X-T-E-R, at DexterMoscow.co.uk. Um, and if I can send you these frameworks, I have a couple of e-books, uh, e um, one which is called um, My Little Red Book of Dexter's QVC Selling Secrets, um, which they can download uh, free on, on the website, um, and also The Seven Keys to a Perfect presentation perfect again is an acronym giving you seven steps i believe p-e-r-f-e-c-t yes seven steps of how you start creating a presentation that influences and persuades so if somebody is interested if you're if anybody's interested to have a chat then please drop me a line and we can have a conversation as well for sure i will make sure all that information is available in our show notes and it's only a gift for people that have been watching up until here. So for those that uh, decided to skip onto the next video, they're going to be missing out uh, on all this excellence. And thank you so much for um, uh, sharing your expertise with us on this. Now, somebody might be, you know, you well, while you were talking, you know, you did mention um, a couple of times where you would have, you know, the CEO never showed up to the meeting and maybe the deal didn't happen. And obviously that happens with quite a lot of people, um, you know, uh, in their day-to-day selling um, endeavors and there's successes and then there's failures and with your processes and frameworks it looks like everything is really designed to be in the um, you know the side or in the park or the you know the court side of the person who's actually doing the the, the selling but 
Can you maybe share with us maybe um, a couple of case studies or, or examples of how your coaching methodologies have actually helped clients, um, you know, achieve significant improvement in their sales presentations or communication skills? Or you could just allude to a product that actually, um, you know, people would have bought on um, QVC, which would have been, um, you know, a, a child or a brainchild of your expertise. Okay, thank you. Yes, I will do it. Because obviously, these processes have to be borne out by fact, um, and, and not just a process. Um, the, the first one, I, I suppose, is something that happened quite a few years ago, I, I was retained by Sainsbury's, um, which is one of our supermarkets over here. Um, and they build superstores. And this is, was during my property years. Um, and actually, it was one of the impetus to move away from residential property, which is very emotional um, and very straining. And I didn't particularly like the the ethos of, you know, say, I've got this off. Can you over overbid this? I didn't like that. So when Sainsbury's approached me, they asked me to buy, would you believe, a street of houses? Because they had very long garden, these houses, and we were chopping off back gardens so that we could improve the um, footprint of the store. So I had to speak to all of these people to try and buy their houses. There was one person who held out, and his name was Mr. Khan. And he wouldn't even speak to me. But on one occasion, he phoned me and he said, um, I'm not going to move. I don't want to move. What are you going to do about it? So I said to him, well, what do you want me to do about it? Because, you know, the store is going to be built. He said, send me agents details. So I went to every agent in the area and I got a stack of details and I left it on his doorstep. He phoned me back and he said, Mr. Moscow, you're unprofessional. And I, the hackles on the back of my neck really stood up because I, I pride myself on my professionalism. And I said, why? And he said, well, I went to these agents. They didn't know me. And I used the same level of anger in his voice that he used to me. And I said, that was not the deal. All I ever did was to give you the details. That was not part of the deal to make introductions. All I've ever wanted to do is come and see you. And he said, I'm here Wednesday. I said, it's not convenient. I'll be there Thursday. It's a device. So I was in, I sat in my car outside his house and I thought, how am I going to persuade this man? And the word came to me and it was from meditation. I went to a meditative level and I thought, what do I need to do? And the word history came to me. So I knocked on his door, he opened the door. I said, look, before you invite me in, which he hadn't done so, tell me your history. He said, well, he said, I was brought up in Iraq and there was a regime change. And I had to leave and I went to Iran. And when the Shah of Iran, you can see how long ago this was, when the Shah of Iran was deposed, I had to come to England. And I said, well, a minute, you've been dispossessed twice already. And I'm seeking to dispossess you again. We'll find a way around this. He said, Mr. Moscow, come in. And we sat down and he brought out a bottle of whiskey and I don't drink spirits, but we, how I got home, I really don't know, but we had half a bottle of that. Ultimately, we did the deal. He got more than anybody else in the row, but that was fine. But the important thing is, he then said to me, come have a look at a house I want to buy. I said, I'm not a surveyor. He said, don't worry, I trust your judgment. And we ultimately did the, did the deal. So my, my message here, if you like, the, influence, the, the incident action and benefit statement is understand the other person understand what their need is and so and it's certainly true of any sales situation we've said it when we understand what the problem is that somebody is facing then a connection can be made and then you can see whether a deal can be done so so i i, I hope it's, it's a story i've told many times but i and it is in a property situation but i think it is relevant and that's the key here any story must be relevant to the individual you're speaking to I don't know if we have time, but I'll tell you a very a funny story about uh, selling something on QVC. Um, I was known, and this blows my cred completely, I was known as Mr. Christmas in latter years of working with QVC. And I had to sell, if you can imagine this, a three-foot-high fiber-optic lit angel with detachable wings. Now, 
In truth, that does not sit well in my home. But I had to think, how would that appeal to others? And it was about £35, and we had five minutes to sell this. So I looked and I thought, how do I make this emotional connection? And I thought, I know how to do this. So I said, this, I, um, I don't know if you believe in angels. I actually do believe in angels. I believe that dad is one is my guardian angel. And so I said, what you have here is the actual image of perhaps what we believe of as an angel. And it's lit beautifully. It's got all these different colors. It's very Christmassy. And the detachable wings means that you can store it after Christmas. Well, I got home and a friend of mine, and by the way, we'd sold out. In five minutes, we sold, out, I think it was something like 50 of these angels. I got home and I couldn't see my um, message machine, um, answer machine flashing. And I picked it up and I could hear this. X, angel, detachable. It was a friend of mine who could almost not speak. She was laughing so much. And she said, here's Colin, Colin that I went to school with. And he said in a very measured voice, Dex, if an angel has detachable wings, how the can it fly? And <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it doesn't always work. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, what a beautiful story. So just putting it all together, all I'm hearing is whiskey is good for you and some angels don't fly. But putting together whiskey and angels, have you ever heard of what's called angels share in terms of whiskey? No. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so when they put whiskey in a barrel, the one that evaporates, they say that's the share of the angels. So, putting it all oh, together, wow. there's 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 a lesson to be learned about drinking a lot of whiskey there from Dexter. You've heard it first from the online prosperity show there. No, I'm really excited with what we've created here, Dexter, and I know you definitely bring a wealth of evidence. Um, you know, um experience and you know with your exposure we in this advertising sales and also real estate sort of industry there's a lot um you know uh that you are sharing with us here now we've heard about you know what was happening in the past with qvc we've heard about what you're doing right now and if people are now interested in jumping on the Moscow bandwagon. What can we expect um, in the future, Dex, um, you know, in the work in the works and stuff that you're going to be bringing, um, you know, to the table? Thank you. Um, obviously, the book, um, Stand Up and Sell, I think I should revise the title now. It should be Sit Down and Zoom as well. <laughs> um, that tells a lot, lot of stories uh, about um, my experience with QVC, um, also uh, exercises and lessons to learn of how we present more effectively. Um, what I'm doing now, I recognize that people are in a lot of fear. Um, and it, it isn't just about selling, it's about um, thinking correctly. And it's one of the reasons that I published recently, I think about um, six months, six or nine months ago, um, my book, A Voyage Without My Father. Um, it is a memoir, but it is also a self-help book. And again, it, it comes from that lyric, that um, The Living Years, where it says, I was not there that morning when my father passed away. And it, it's in this, the um, lyric of the song. It's very emotional. You can hear that. Um, and what I recognize is that my experience of not being able to say goodbye to my dad, because kids were not allowed into hospital wards at that time, is a situation that so many other people faced during the pandemic, not being there to hold the hands of their loved ones. And so I published this book um, also to give people the courage to be vulnerable Um and it translates to what we've been talking about. So many people are fearful of standing up in, to a group of people or in a group of people or even presenting in this environment. So a lot of what I do now is to understand what, pe what people are going through emotionally, that word again, so that I can take them from that pain that they're suffering of loss, of grief, to growth and then to gratitude and then move that into a an environment through positive intelligence which identifies 
voices in our heads that prevent us from realizing our full potential and then linking it to helping them to sell better, to influence better, to be better, if you like. So that's that's my motivation. I'm of an age where perhaps I could retire. I don't want to. I love seeing that light bulb moment when people understand who they are, what they need to do, and how that can benefit them and others. So if you like, that's my ethos moving forward. Understand ourselves, understand what motivates others. And if you can profit from that, if you can prosper from that, then that's what we should be focusing on. Oh, that is a beautiful sentiment right there, Dexter. And I'm really glad we got this opportunity to have a sit down with you and listen to you sharing your expertise with us. It's my delight, Prosper. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I hope, sincerely hope, that people have gained something that they can use today. Um, I work across sectors and I, I love doing that. I love finding what people need and then satisfying that need. So again, thank you for the opportunity of sharing. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Like you were saying, it's all about show and tell. But I'll tell you, I learned a lot about whiskey today than I've ever learned from anyone in one sitting. So for those that are watching right now, that concludes our interview with Dexter Moscow. And, you know, you've heard from him with his presentation skills and um, how he practices what he calls positive intelligent. And uh, Dexter has shared with us invaluable insights on creating compelling sales presentation and also leveraging the televisual age. The closer you are to the camera, the closer you are to the bank. That's also one thing that I was getting from how he was um, saying it. Because if you can speak and tell stories, you will be able to influence and impact those that you're going to be uh, you know, serving in the future. Also, be sure to check out the links and grab Dexter's book, Stand Up and Sell, which he says he's going to change to sit down and sell, considering it's now a sitting down scenario with zoom sessions and also explore the online course that is attached to that now to my guest dexter i can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your expertise with our audience and those that are watching please help me thank dexter and be sure to subscribe to the online prosperity show so that you are not going to miss out on any of these enlightening interviews that's it from today and from the team behind the scenes, bye for now.